Good morning, and welcome to our worship at Christ Our Anchor this morning. We are needing to stay virtual in this time, but we want you to know that we are continuing to assess the situation, and um, we are open to the option of being back together again as soon as we know that that is safe. We have learned through this pandemic that there are many ways that God can bring us together, and we're so thankful for the technology that can make this possible. My name is Dottie LaPenta, and I am with you while Pastor Jesse Lowry is on maternity leave. And speaking of that, can you believe this adorable Lowry baby, baby that came into the world this week? We are so um, thankful and so happy for the Lowry family. I think we could actually spend the whole worship service just looking at baby pictures, but Pastor Jesse said, no, we can't do that. So we will proceed with worship. There are a few things I'd like to highlight for you this morning. Next week, the session has called the annual meeting following the worship service. Um, you will be receiving at that meeting the annual report and also voting on Pastor Jesse's terms of call. So we need to come into the Zoom meeting at 11 a.m. The um, Zoom link was posted this past week in hopes and notes, and it will be posted again this coming week. So it will be made easy for you to get into that meeting. Um, also, this month, I think specifically the date is January the 24th, Christ Our Anchor celebrates its 40th birthday. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. Um, the official celebration is actually going to be on Pentecost Sunday, June the 5th, and already some wonderful planning has begun to make that event um, a great occasion. But we do have a mystery going on. There seems to be a box of pictures that um, uh, were taken prior to the year 2000 with some of the ministries and activities and people of the church at that time, and the box is missing. And I think every nook and cranny and cupboard and corner of this building has been searched. So uh, the committee is thinking that maybe somebody took the box home to actually organize the pictures. So um, if you are the type of person that would do that and there's a box in your house and you're not sure what's in it, um, if you could just check and see, maybe it's a possibility that we can um, find uh, what is missing. Um, finally, I do want to announce that um, Broadneck Baptist Church and Cape St. Clair uh, United Methodist Church will be sponsoring the winter relief this week and how it's going to be needed this week with the cold weather and the storm coming. Um, I went on the sign-up sheet this morning, which um, is also posted on Hopes and Notes, and um, there are still slots to be filled where help is needed. Some of the assignments you can actually do at home and actually take to the church what, what is needed. So just check it out and see if that is something that you feel called to do this week and to help with. So let us now come together and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me in the opening prayer. Your son, Jesus, expressed righteous anger at abuses and injustice. He knew when circumstances needed to be changed. Be with us in those times when we get weary and apathy takes over our hearts. Strengthen and energize us with your spirit to confront injustice in our world and teach us ways to make things right. As we gather for worship this day, place truth in our hearts and lead us forward in your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, friends. I am Debbie Barber, the Christian educator here at Christ Our Anchor Presbyterian Church, and I am so thankful to be here with you today. I have a, one quick announcement, or just check-in, really, before I start. I know I always have a bag of fun things, but the first thing, I was just wanting to check in to see how everybody is doing on their Peace Bingo Challenge for this new year. Um, this is what the, the sheet looks like. They're in the hopes and notes. Um, I'm doing all right. I haven't, still haven't gotten a bingo yet, and I haven't posted a new picture of the bulletin board yet because I haven't gotten any emails or texts or messages from anybody to say that 
that they've completed a bingo. But once you do complete something up and down or side to side or diagonally, please do drop me a line. Either give me a quick call or call the church, send an email, text, message, anything that you want to do. Maybe a carrier pigeon. And let me know what you did, how much fun you had doing it, what kind of activities you participated in. And, um, and I will make sure I get the heart with your name on it on our bulletin board. So thank you for, for participating in that. I have heard that there have been a couple of really fun in, encounters along the way so far, but no bingo yet. So hopefully that'll happen soon. So in my bag of magic, I brought a couple things. So if you know what some of these things are, I'll hold them up high above. I have, I've got one, I've got another, and I've got a third that could be kind of messy. So hold tight, everybody. Here we go. Hopefully it didn't leak in my bag. I do have that happen sometimes, but, and my third thing is this. So if you know what these things are, we, I've got here, I'll just name them out loud since y'all, I can't see your messages right now, but if you know what they are and you've typed them in, thank you. So I have a broom and I have some glass cleaner, some window cleaner and a, a towel to clean and then a duster. What do we use these things for? Anyone, anyone, anyone in here? To clean, that's right. We use them to clean, to clean our houses. Do you all ever help with cleaning at your house, especially if you're little? Do you, are you a helper? All right, let's see how good we can be to pretend that we are, use the motions to pretend like we're cleaning. So if I hold up the broom, I want you, everybody, if you're young or old, however you want to participate, feel free to stand up and you're gonna to pretend to sweep. So I've got the broom, so everybody sweep, 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 sweep. All right, and if I hold up the glass cleaner and the, the towel. We're gonna spray, spray, spray and wipe our windows. Spray, 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 wipe your window. Wipe your window. Okay, all right, last but not least, the duster. This I think is one of my favorite because it's colorful and it's, and it's fun and you just dust everything off. So I'm gonna hold up the duster. All right, I'm gonna try it one more time for you all out at home, all right? Let's see if I hold up one of them, do the action at home. Ready, set, all right, you're gonna clean, okay. All right, whew. and you're gonna, now you're gonna sweep, everybody sweep, 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 sweep. All right, and last but not least, let's dust. Oh yeah, it's very clean here already, so I feel kind of silly dusting when it's not even dusty. But as you can see, it, is, it actually can be very fun to clean. And how do you know? How do you know when it's time to clean your house? Let's think, here are some times, some signs that might let you know it's time to clean. It's time to clean your house when your feet stick to the floor when you walk through the kitchen. Or maybe, maybe it's time to clean the house when your mother can't find you when she comes into your room to wake you up in the morning. Maybe that's a sign. Or perhaps it's time to clean the house when the kids, other kids in the neighborhood use their fingers to write, wash me in the dirt on your windows. Or maybe it's time to clean the house when there are more dishes in the kitchen sink than there are in the cabinets. And last but not least, maybe it's a sign to clean the house when you have enough dust bunnies under your bed to start a bunny farm. I think, I think you get the idea. So today in church, we're gonna talk about a time when Jesus did some house cleaning. It was time for the annual Passover celebration, so Jesus was traveling to Jerusalem. When he went to the temple, he couldn't believe what he saw. People were selling cattle, sheep, and doves to be used as sacrifices in the temple. Some men were even changing people's, um, I'm sorry, were even charging people to change their money so they could pay their temple taxes. It looked more like a flea market than a place to worship God. Jesus was so angry that he made a whip from a rope and drove out the cattle and the sheep and, that, and those that were selling them out, he drove them all out from the temple. And he even turned over the money changers' tables. To the ones that were selling the doves, he said, get out of it here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Jesus did some serious house cleaning that day. So as we think about Jesus cleansing the temple, we can also be reminded that there is some other, thing, other cleaning that needs to be done. The Bible tells us that we are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives us. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. And as we bring in this new year, 
and we prayerfully consider our star words of intention. And I actually brought my star word because I thought it was kind of appropriate for today. And if you haven't had a chance to get a star word, we still have those available for you all. But my star word is hope. And even more appropriately, my husband, Jason, his star word is cleansing. So I think that Jason and I are going to have some hope that we do some cleansing in this, this year with our kids' help. <laughs> um, but as we think about those words of intention, it's a good time to think about how we might use our hearts and how our hearts might need some cleansing too. So let us pray together. God, help us to remember that, you, that we are your temple and that your spirit lives in us. Help us to keep our lives clean and useful for service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, it's going to take me a minute to, to clean up my mess. <laughs> Today's first scripture reading is from Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2. Listen now to the word of God. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. 
After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he knew himself what was in everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last Sunday, we met Jesus at a wedding. Yes, when the wine started to run out, he had the servants fill six stone jars with water. And when they took a cup to the steward, what he tasted was not water, but wine, the good wine. Jesus had turned water into wine so that the celebration could continue, but most of the guests didn't notice. Jesus was not just another guest at the wedding, sitting at his assigned table, eating, drinking, smiling, conversing, enjoying the festivities. Could you please bring that Jesus back? Or better yet, bring in the good shepherd with the lambs on his shoulder and the children clinging to his legs, or the sweet baby Jesus boy whose birth we just celebrated, or the healing Jesus, or the storyteller Jesus. Yeah, that would be fun. But please tell this angry prophet Jesus to go back out into the parking lot and come in as another version of himself another more pleasant version of himself. Anything but this angry, enraged Jesus. I mean, Christ our anchor friends, it is only my second week here and you've handed me this scripture, this Jesus? I feel queasy. And that's exactly how our scripture from John's gospel this morning should make us feel. And seriously, I need to say that given this scripture on a week, when yet there has been another act of violence against a synagogue, it makes me feel queasy because scripture is fragile. Scripture gets uh, misinterpreted. And a lot of times when we read about scripture and what's happening, we think that um, it's talking about those people. Those people, not us, not God's favored, but those people. So this morning, I would like to challenge you to put yourself in the shoes of the religious leaders in the temple. Put yourself into their shoes and, and realize that Jesus is not angry and needing to cleanse the temple itself. Jesus is not angry at the faith that should be practiced from this religion. Jesus is angry because the essence of the faith, God's precious gift of the faith, has been pushed to the side, has become secondary. The story is known as the cleansing of the temple but it is really not a scene of nice smelling lemon oil. Jesus is not engaged in actual housekeeping. He's actually in a rampage. The cattle are loose, the doves are squawking, he's driving things out, and the leaders are shri shrieking, who are you, who are you? You don't get to do that. And Jesus says, no you don't get to do what you are doing. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this story is placed at the end of Jesus' ministry when he has absolutely had it with the religious leaders. But in the Gospel of John, it's like the public inauguration of Jesus' ministry. It's in chapter 2. What a way to begin. <clears throat> and where do we start? Let's start with the temple. Israel is under Roman occupation, but the Jewish people are allowed their worship and they are allowed their 
religious practice under the Roman Empire. Now, I have never lived in an occupied country, so I really don't know what that must be like. I can only imagine that the religious leaders were always kind of looking over their shoulder, wanting to remain in the graces of the empire. Well, on this particular day, the pilgrims are coming to the temple from near and far for the Passover. Well, they couldn't bring animals with them for sacrifice on their journey because all the animals that had to be sacrificed for the ritual had to be unblemished. And that would be impossible to maintain on a rugged journey. So they had to buy the animals once they got to the temple. And they had to pay a temple tax. So the finance committee set up its table along with the money changers who could change Roman coins into shekels. So it, it really is kind of a marketplace. And I think maybe the leaders could have rationalized that it was out of necessity. But the marketplace was set up in the only area of the temple where Gentiles were allowed to enter. With the space needed for these business transactions, there was no room for visitors who may have been curious and come in to the place where they were allowed to see what the worship was all about. The religious leaders were running the temple, holding on to an institution as an occupied people, knowing that the more money they exchanged, the more doves and sheep they sold, the better financial report they would have at the end of the quarter. And they, presenting that stable financial report, would be more secure in their relationship with Rome, the empire. Well, Jesus is coming to the temple as a Passover pilgrim to celebrate the Passover feast. But when he comes in and he looks around, as Miss Debbie said, he becomes upset. He becomes angry, the very angry, an angry prophet. And what upset him was the marketplace. The marketplace and perhaps the knowledge of corruption that is often present when money is exchanged. Perhaps that place that for visitors that was always available had been taken over and there was no room for them. And perhaps witnessing the exploitation of people who had traveled for a religious festival long and hard and now they were being asked to buy animals and exchange coins. But more than all that, the temple was the sacred place for these people. The temple was the sacred place for these people to come and worship the structure in Jerusalem where God was actually located in the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. The temple held the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the law, and this law defined the relationship that God had with the people. In the Psalms, we even read, the law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul, more to be desired than gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. This was the place where God's precious gift was located and the people could come and worship. God had given these people this place, this choice gift, but it had been overtaken with their own priorities. The image of honey in the New Testament is not used lightly or often. And it does refer to that thick golden substance produced by bees, but the image also implies a choice gift, sweet, generous, and in great abundance. But Jesus saw God had become more of an afterthought. Temple life was blindsided by business and profit. The precious gift from law, the relationship with God, more desire than gold, sweeter than honey, and its drippings was far from the first thing on their minds. One year for his birthday, <clears throat> my husband received the gift of a beehive, not from me. So I cleared a shelf in my kitchen for all the honey we would be producing. But the fact is, the shelf stayed empty. 
But in those years, my husband had a great time. He obtained such pleasure learning about beekeeping and being an active member of the Beekeepers Association, forming great friendships. Well, the shelf stayed empty, but I was happy that my daughters would follow their dad out to the hive and learn about a community where the leader was a queen. Well, one day, one of his fellow beekeepers came over, and after attending the hive, they brought in this little jar of honey and said, this honey is from your dad's hive. We proudly placed it all by itself on that waiting shelf, and it stayed there for a long time because it was the only honey we ever produced, and we only ate it one drop at a time. When we had guests, the girls would take the jar off the shelf and say, this is our honey from our hive. It's very valuable. Do you want to taste? And the guests would get one drop of honey. Well, God's gifts are more abundant than one jar of honey. God's gifts are dripping from the honeycomb, as the Psalms tell us. But very much like, much like the temple leaders, how easily we can forget about the choice gifts that God has given us and why we are here in the first place. It is so easy for other priorities to take over. Now we notice in our scriptures, and it's very interesting, that the temple leaders did not throw Jesus out. They were willing to hear by what authority Jesus was engaging in this rampage. Now if you've ever listened to Handel's Messiah, you might remember that bass recitative that sings, and the Lord whom you seek shall, shall suddenly come into the temple. Those are words from the prophet Malachi, and the religious leaders would probably have known this prophecy. And indeed, this angry Jesus had suddenly come into the temple. But when Jesus talks about himself as God's temple and being destroyed and rebuilt in three days, the religious leaders have no idea what he is saying. I'm not sure I would have had any idea. Maybe they didn't want to know what he was saying, but it did sound confusing. And in John's Gospel, what we learn is that the religious leaders, their skepticism really became hostility towards Jesus because this was not the Lord they were expecting. One of their own making, a cooperative Lord, a Lord affirming their power and their practices and their priorities. This was a Lord who was turning over tables. That was threatening. So what is the takeaway from this morning's difficult scripture? that you gave to your guest preacher the second week, which I won't remind you of all the time. Well, first of all, I think the takeaway is that the church is also an institution, along with everything that comes with institutional life, year-end financial reports, and how wonderful it is when they are strong reports which reflect stewardship and generosity and integrity. The church is an institution where annual meetings occur, committees, records, minutes, polity, policy, rehearsals, budgets. It's all a part of running a church. And it's important that it's done well because everything we do is about honoring and serving God. But institutional aspects can become so big and so time consuming we can be so driven by them that the risk is that we very bury the foundation on which the institution is based. The choice gift that our generous and loving God has given us. And that is the gift of God's Son, Jesus. More desire than gold, sweeter than honey, precious, and valuable, but he will turn over tables. And secondly, 
The religious leaders did not understand. Maybe they didn't want to understand. But Jesus' message was that he would be the temple. God's presence would never be limited to a building or a particular space or a particular people. Jesus would take sacredness into the world where God is present and at work in any time and any place. And this Jesus, we know, would be killed, but would rise again to carry forth the presence of God throughout all the world. The religious leaders could not get out of their own mindset. Has that ever happened to you, that you just can't get out of your own mindset? In all honesty, we can probably relate to that because we like to think what we think. I gave us a community star word last week. It was the word notice. And I suggested that we look for God at work in the world in small, subtle ways that might lead to big changes. Well, this week, I want you to keep that word as a community in addition to your individual words. And I want you to take that star word and notice the places in the world on January the 16th, 2022, where God's presence and work need to happen. Notice those places and follow Jesus into those places. So perhaps when you see someone or some group who is intentionally excluded, when you see obvious signs of a system being manipulated to inhibit the marginalized and to keep the powerful in place, take notice and ask yourself, would Jesus be turning tables? When you are walking through a neighborhood and you think, wow, these people should pick up their trash, but then you take notice that trash cans are only placed once every six blocks, but in your neighborhood, they're on every block. Ask yourself, would Jesus be turning tables? This past week at the Environmental Rights Stakeholders Rally, we were reminded to take notice in what communities is there a concentration of landfills or concrete companies and battery disposals being built? And what communities are safely, safely distanced from environmental hazards? Would Jesus be turning tables? Martin Luther King, whose birthday we celebrate tomorrow, said, it's always the right time to do what's right. What we realize, it might be the right time, but it might not be easy. It might not be convenient, or it might not fit in with what's been working for us. But just maybe, just maybe, the takeaway from today is that we can be thankful for this passage. And we can be thankful for the metaphorical question that is very, very relevant to our time. And that is, would Jesus be turning tables because of what's going on here? You see, we are so skilled at our rationalizations. It is so easy for us to come to exist in a temple of our own construction where the Jesus we understand is just kind of a Jesus of our own making. I mean, we feel like we're pals with Jesus. You know, Jesus is our savior. And so we tend to think that he is perpetually pleased with us. Now Jesus is for us and with us and in us and loves us unconditionally. But in that love, there are times when Jesus speaks to us, and those words might be, you don't get to do that. So as the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ our anchor friends, let us continue together to strive to build a community that is pleasing to God. 
where Jesus doesn't have to come in and turn any tables. Attention to institutional aspects in a well-run church is fine and good, but not if it ever buries the essence of why we are here in the first place. And let us remember that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So we go out from our churches. We go out from beyond the wood and the stone. We go out from beyond the physical structure of the building. We go out from all those institutional aspects and we carry into the world the gift that we have received, God's Son, Jesus, and all that he was about. Sweeter than honey, more precious than gold. But when needed, never hesitant to turn tables. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
As we come to a time of prayer, I hope that you will make your joys and your concerns uh, known on the comments section um, because we do pay attention to those and we would want to know what you want to offer up in prayer this morning. You can also email the church office, but please be assured that those are, are getting um, recognized and that we are lifting your requests in prayer. Are there any requests in the room today, this morning? Oh, Thanksgiving. Okay, any others? Okay, let us come together in prayer. God, you are our refuge and our strength. You are present at all times. You are present in our joys. You are present in our challenges. We pray this day for the leader of this church, Pastor Jesse and her family, Jason, Penny, and Blake. Our hearts are full of delight because in a newborn child is your message about the future, about hope, about fullness of life. And we are able to realize our responsibilities to care for your creation for future generations. We pray that the transition from hospital to home will be smooth, be with the Lowrys as they walk through the myriad of emotions that come with giving birth and getting to know this new member of their family. May they be strengthened by the prayers and love emanating from the community. And speaking of celebrations, Lord, we thank you for the celebration of Chris and Jim's 40th wedding anniversary, for the years they have shared, for the journey that, that they have gone through together for the, the covenant that, that they took on that day of their marriage. We thank you for those opportunities to, to be together, to live together, to share life, to be joined in a union that embraces each day and what it brings to us, both the joys and those times of, of difficulty and challenge. We thank you, Lord, for their celebration. We ask today for your shelter and healing from the world's upheaval, from places where there is violence. We ask that you bring together all of your children, the different, different faiths of the world, the different religions, and, and somehow help us to understand that we can be together as your children, even in those differences, that we can learn from each other, that we can support each other because you are the God of love. We ask for your healing from heartache and loss, from broken relationships. We ask for the courage that we need in some work situations and some school situations, that even though we are sometimes exhausted, we can keep up with the necessary work that we need to do. And help us to turn away from the temptation to stray from you towards those things that only offer fleeting comfort and satisfaction. We know that our own agendas, that our own priorities, that what benefits us can take us over so easily. Help us to continuously turn our eyes upon Jesus. Equip us to practice faithful discernment in our prayers, surrounding ourselves with honest truth-tellers, who will hold us to your ethic of love and justice. As we celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are reminded of those who have gone before us, who sought to pave a path of righteousness and freedom for all. Help us to continue the work of discerning your intentions for the world and living according to your will. We pray for all those who are undergoing diagnostic medical tests, for those who are undergoing treatments. You know them by name. Assure them that you are near. And we lift prayers this day for your comfort and your healing presence for Lisa and Dave Mattel, Rich and Helen Kelly, for comfort for the family of Catherine Rhonda Moore's friend who died recently, we thank you for recoveries from surgeries that are going well for Ann Hatcher and Bonnie Lang, 
And we also pray for those who are feeling that recovery is a long and hard struggle. Gracious God, there are concerns, desires, and, and hearts full of, of things we want to lay before you. So in this time, in this moment of silence, hear our prayers. Gracious God, we ask for your safety and protection in the winter storm that's coming to this area, and especially for those who are insecure about a roof over their heads tonight, that they might find safe and warm shelter. We pray for our sisters and brothers at Broadneck Baptist Church and Cape St. Clair Methodist who are hosting winter relief this week. We come here, Lord, knowing the essence of this place thankful that you are behind these ministries, that you are leading us and guiding us into the places where God needs to be. We are thankful for open eyes and ears and minds and hearts that can take notice and take Jesus into places that need the message of grace and hope and salvation. So united as the body of Christ, we lift all these prayers to you, Savior God. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Particularly in this time as we meet virtually, but in all times, we are thankful for your ongoing financial support for Christ our Anchor. Please refer to the bulletin for the many ways you can give. A generous goal, God calls us to live generous lives. So let us present our gifts and offerings with glad hearts in order to further Christ's mission and ministry. Please be safe this week, um, stay connected, um, be together in whatever way that we can be together, knowing that the essence, the essence is Jesus Christ and all that Jesus brought to our world. As you do so well at Christ Our Anchor, let us continue to take Jesus into the places that need to know that presence. And may the God of hope give you the joy and peace in believing so that you can abound with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.